Well, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, you know the rules. I've got to be brief. There's a shot clock running on me. And um, I also just, uh, I would have been brief anyhow. I had a very sobering conversation recently with my seven-year-old son. And I want to leave aside for a moment the improbability of my having a seven-year-old son. Um, but he had, he had, well, it didn't seem improbable to me, but he had not listened to his babysitter one day. He's a wonderful, wonderful kid, great kid, but he'd misbehaved a little bit. And my wife, Rosemary, called me at work and she said, um, you need to come home early from work. We need to talk to Nate about his character and the choices he makes and his purpose on the planet. Um, you <laughs> can see that Rosemary's a really great mom, but a little bit intense. And uh, I, I, went, I went home early. And we had this conversation with Nate, it went very well. He was very respectful. As I said, he's a great kid. He didn't say a word. It was a monologue with Rosemary doing most of the monologuing. Uh, but afterwards, she had the good sense to say, now, Nate, is there anything in turn that you would like to say to us? And he looked us dead in the eye and he said, thank you for your little presentation. So I, uh, I, like, I like to wrap up before I evoke that in, a, uh, in an audience. So I will be uh, concise. Uh, let me just say that there's been a diversity of uh, of, of speakers here talking about all types of innovation and, and a lot of uh, conversation about social innovation. And as diverse as this group is, um, I would argue that uh, we all have one thing in common, which is the desire to do this work in ways that are more powerful, in ways that are more transformative, uh, which if you come from the nonprofit sector has a whole set of challenges uh, attendant to it. Uh, I often think of a of a New Yorker cartoon in which a husband and wife are sitting in their easy chairs in the living room and a puppy dog comes in up on his hind legs and the caption just reads, once again I find myself in the rather awkward position of having to ask one of you for a biscuit. Uh, th th this is what life in the nonprofit sector can be like. And the, the, the need to do this work more powerfully is, is so important for so many reasons. We started Share Our Strength uh, because of the famine in Ethiopia. And there's a, a, a slide here of this wonderful, wonderful girl I met in Ethiopia named Alima Dari. Um, she's, um, was, I think at the time, was about 11 years old. We had this fabulous conversation. I was standing in the back of her classroom and with a group of Americans that were there, and I saw her lips move and say something to me, but I couldn't quite make it out. So I went over to her and I said, I'm sorry. I said, what did you say? And she said, I, she said, I said, God bless you for coming here and for helping us because we were helping to build a school and a hospital uh, in this uh, neighborhood where she, she lived. And um, we had this fabulous conversation, stayed in touch for a number of years. I'll, I'll come back to her in a moment. But it really fueled uh, my commitment to our work both internationally uh, and, print, and also our work domestically uh, here in the United States, which has been a big, big focus of Share Our Strength's No Kid Hungry campaign. Uh, the reason I tell you that is because although the desire was there, we were on a trajectory that I think was very similar to a lot of organizations. We had a good idea, we started to grow, then we hit a plateau and we got stuck and we weren't able to keep up with the needs of Alima and our work in Ethiopia or our work all around the United States. If you use revenues for, as a proxy, for example, I would say that uh, we had uh, uh, about revenues of about $13 million in 2006, seven, and eight, um, but they jumped to 19 million in 2009, 26 million in 2010, 33 last year, and 43 this year. There'll be about 51 million next year. So we did some things to break out of that, and that's what I want to talk to you about uh, today, be, uh, particularly at a time we're in our, in our own country. We have such enormous need and such enormous levels of poverty uh, at a time when our economy is struggling and our political system has been paralyzed and to some degree broken, with 22.5% of our children living below the poverty line, 16.5 million poor kids in rich America, 46 million Americans on food stamps for the first time in the history of the program, and half of them being children. So how do you do this work in ways that are more different? Uh, my version of being fearless is to think about the, what I think of as the strategic and the necessity and the moral imperative of breaking all the rules. Uh, and what I mean is that there were a set of rules that we found were constraining our growth. Um, and I'll give you four examples of what we started to do that was a little bit counter to the conventional wisdom and the very powerful effect it had uh, on our ability to grow, uh, share our strengths work. The first rule is the one that says, in the nonprofit world, I don't know if anybody here has ever been in the, in the position of the puppy in the New York cartoon, if anyone's ever applied for a grant. Um, we can talk afterwards outside about how much fun that is. Uh, but um, we, 
we felt that the rule was that you needed to be polite and ask other people for money. And we decided to break that rule and instead earn money uh, and share our strength. So we started with a $2,000 cash on a Visa card. Uh, to this day, we've raised about 360, raised and spent $360 million. Uh, and about two thirds of it comes from uh, marketing contracts, cause related marketing, corporate partnerships that really represent commerce. We decided that we didn't want to be a nonprofit that we was redistributing wealth. We wanted to be a nonprofit that was actually creating wealth, not just fighting for our share of the charitable pie, but making that pie grow. So we've, it's a long story, but we very methodically organized the restaurant and the food service industry, thinking they would feel a connection to the issue of hunger. We ended up with about 15,000 chefs and restaurateurs closely connected to our work, so closely connected that companies all across the country, to some degree across the world, started to come to us and say, can you um, uh, position us to do more business with these chefs and restaurants? We want to sign marketing contracts with Share Our Strength whether it was American Express or Domino Sugar or uh, Illy uh, Espresso um, and on and on and on. So uh, we realized there was really this opportunity not to just have to ask or even beg for money, but to actually earn your money in the nonprofit sector, different way to think about it. Uh, the second for us was uh, breaking the rule that said you should be measured by your administrative overhead. Um, we thought you should be measured by your impact uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, if you think about it, you know, nobody has ever, uh, if I've got it with me, nobody has ever walked into um, an Apple store and said, I think I really like that iPhone, but I need to know what your administrative overhead was before I'm, uh, I want to make this purchase, right? That, that conversation would never happen. It happens all the time in our sector and is very handicapping. So we said, look, we're not just going to feed kids. We're going to end childhood hunger by the year 2015, and we laid out a strategy to do that. When we met with our partners around the country, uh, most of them were very apprehensive. They thought, well, how much is that going to cost? What is it going to take? Uh, would we really have the, the funds to do that? What if we missed? And what there really was, the subtext was a real cultural discomfort to being accountable to a very specific outcome. But for our business partners, it was the mirror image opposite. You're setting a goal, putting a, st a stake in the ground, holding yourself accountable to meeting it, we want to be a part of that. Uh, and we grew in very powerful ways. Uh, the third rule for us was that um, although we're not a political organization and we're not a partisan organization, we realized that social entrepreneurship without public policy, without a robust public policy component, uh, was kind of like a, a garage band without amps. It was very cool, it was a great place to be, nobody would really know what you were doing three blocks away. Uh, you had to have public policy to scale your work. I'll give you one equation and you'll understand both the problem and the opportunity uh, of our No Kid Hungry strategy of ending childhood hunger here in the United States. 21 million kids in the country get a free school lunch. They're all eligible for free school breakfast. Only 9 million get it. And when the schools are closed in the summertime, only 3 million get it. It's bought and paid for, for all 21 million. This is one of the best kept billion dollar secrets in Washington. So, so much bipartisan support and such a track record that it's actually exempt from the sequestration, the automatic budget cuts that could come down the pike at the end of this year. So we've been going to governor after governor, mayor, senator, saying, help us knock down the barriers in your states to do this. And we've added tens of thousands of kids to these programs because public policy can enable you to do that. And fourth and finally, the rule says you got to collaborate, and we're all about collaboration. We collaborate with lots of other nonprofits, but we believed that we needed to break that rule and also compete. Not to compete to put others out of business, but to compete to be the best version of ourselves. So for example, I was on the Timberland board for 10 or 11 years. One of the things I learned on that board, my only corporate experience, was that the company and the board and the senior management were very focused on outperforming their peers, and they understood that to compete at any level, you need to compete at every level. So Timberland never thought of themselves as just competing to sell us boots. They thought of competing to get the very best people who work in fashion and footwear anywhere in the world to come and work at Timberland and to stay there longer. And they measured that. To compete at any level, you must compete at every level. In our world, in the nonprofit sector, uh, we have the opposite instinct. Can we do it cheap? Can we do it free? Can we do it pro bono? Can we do it with whatever resources are left over as opposed to the best resources in the world? So those are the four rules that we felt that we had to break. And we had this sense of urgency because this, this young woman here, Alima, who I stayed in touch with for many years, um, I always think of her in the context of something Dr. Martin Luther King once said, which is in this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. 
Procrastination is the thief of time, and the tide in the affairs of men and women does not remain at flood. It ebbs. Um, on one of the trips to Ethiopia that I couldn't make, I, I sent my, uh, a, a note with one of my colleagues, Chuck Schofield, who um, we talk five times a day wherever we are in the, in the world, and I didn't hear from him for five days or 10 days or 12 days, and then I finally got an email that said, I hate like hell to tell you this, but Alima died from cerebral malaria. Uh, the hospital that we were trying to help build, um, among many other organizations, was unfinished, and by the time they transported her to Addis Ababa, it was too late. So Dr. Martin Luther King's words coming alive for me. Um, that's why I say I think there's a strategic necessity and a moral imperative to think about how we not only come up with great ideas, but how we scale them, how we create community wealth, how we hold ourselves to uh, measures of success and define that. Uh, that's what the work of Share Our Strength our No Kid Hungry campaign, our sister organization, Subsidiary Community Wealth Ventures, uh, has been all about. So thanks for the opportunity to tell you about it. Great to be here. Thank you.